This screencast will cover routes of administration. The aims and objectives of this session will cover understanding of the common routes of administration. We will also look at the advantages and disadvantages of these common routes. The aim of um, medication or drug administration is to reach the site of action. And in the process of reaching the site of action, there will be other factors involved and you will learn more about this in the following sessions throughout your course. You'll learn about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So this session is specifically an introduction on the different routes and the common ones you'll come across. So you'll learn more about uh, when you more in the second year about when we manufacture medications and more about how that is um, kind of really important to look at drug concentration, about therapeutic effects and the toxicity effects. But as I mentioned, today's session is specifically about the roots, specifically around understanding the advantages and disadvantages. Consider the different routes of administrations you've come across and whether there's examples you can think of from your placement or if you've seen them in um, hospital or community uh, in your household. Think about the most common ones you would see people using. So most of you would have thought of oral as this is the most common route of administration. We will learn more about this in a lot more detail to think about the advantages and the disadvantages of this. However, you might have also thought of things like the ocular route, which is the eyes. So that might be eye drops, eye ointments, or we've got the buccal route, which is inside the mouth, and the sublingual route. So the difference between the buccal and the sublingual route are very important. We'll look at the difference between these two. And then we've got intravenous, which is also a very common route you probably see in hospital, intermuscular, subcutaneous, transdermal. And then we've got other things like inhalation, which would be preliminary or nasal. And then we've got vaginal or rectal. So you can see this a range of different routes that we need to learn as pharmacists, we are the experts in medication. So this is a very key area for us to know very well. And we're very, um, it's, it's very helpful for us to be able to be part of the multidisciplinary team and offer these different examples depending on the needs of the patient. So why is the oral route the most popular? So have a moment to consider why do you think the oral route is the most popular route? So you might have thought about it being convenient and it's portable so people can put it in their bags, they can carry it with them. You can self-administer, you're not relying on anyone else to give you medication, you can administer it yourself compared to somebody needing to have an injection. It's available in lots of different formulations, so it's available as a tablet, a capsule, liquid, soluble. Lots of different um, things you'll learn more about in, in formulation. It's one of the least expensive as well because it doesn't involve um, preservatives and it, depending on the formulation you're looking at. But also it, when we think about things like when we need to administer medication that involves possibly needing a nurse. So that increases the costs to the to the health service. So all of these things need to be considered as well when giving medication, the, the, the aspects of the, uh, the cost and the manufacturing, which again, as I say, this is an introduction. So you will learn more a lot about these things in future sessions. Why can't some medicines be taken orally? Why do we have to consider other routes of administration? So let's consider if patients can't swallow or that's one example. What other examples can you think of 
is why patients need to have different routes of administration available to them. So take another moment to think about this. So you might have thought about the need for fast onset of action. So when we take an oral medication, it doesn't always work immediately. So some medications are needed to be working within seconds or minutes compared to a delay which happens with oral medication. You'll learn more about bioavailability, but this is really important because medications, when they enter through oral routes, they're broken down by the liver and that will give us a less portion of the medication that was ingested in the first place. So bioavailability will differ depending on the route. So we also need to think about the stomach acid that will also have a big impact and destroy the medication as well. So sometimes we need to think about the irritation it may cause to the stomach. So it's important to take that into consideration when considering oral medication. Is it compatible? Will it be uh, degraded, such as, for example, insulin? Being a protein, it will be broken down. So we can't give insulin orally. So sometimes it can be a problem if, for example, the taste is bitter, the formulation needs to be considered, or we need to look at a different way of administering it. If we want a local effect, for example, some medications need to be given locally. So if it's a, a cream that needs to act on a specific area or eye drop. Consider if a patient is unconscious and they're not able to swallow or they're vomiting or refusing medication. So there's lots of things to consider about patient specific patient centered care and how we can give options on different situations. So thinking about the reasons we don't give oral, we did mention a few examples. Thinking about the examples we gave earlier, the different routes, which one do you think would be the fastest if we needed something to work very fast? Thinking quickly now, which one would you suggest as the fastest route of administration? So if you said intravenous, then that's correct. Intravenous would give the fastest route. So that would act within 30 to 60 seconds. So under a minute, you'd experience an effect. With inhalation, patients would experience an effect within two to three minutes. With sublingual, so that's under the tongue, three to five minutes. And intramuscular, so that's into a, a muscle, usually the gluteal muscle, so the large buttocks muscle, or uh, any other large muscle or the arm, that would take uh, a more time to, for it to take effect, 10 to 20 minutes. Rectal, so it varies with rectal. You can see there's a range between 5 to 30 minutes. And an oral, you, you're looking at 30 to 90 minutes, so it takes longer for the oral to take effect. If you can look at the peaks on that graph, you can see that peak at the top with the yellow curve for the intravenous is much quicker. But you can see the area under the curve should be the same. It's just the peak in time. So this again is something you'll learn a lot more about when you're learning about your pharmacokinetics. So it's just something to bear in mind with options and knowing when uh, medications are given and how quick they act. So we're gonna go into more detail on each common route of administration. So it's important that you apply this knowledge to your other sessions when trying to explain, for example, why people need to take medication in the way they do, so I'll give an example such as sublingual. You will it'd be really important to understand why it's put under the tongue and what makes it different to if a patient took a medication that was sublingual and swallowed it. What will be the impact of that? So appreciate the difference between the different routes 
and think about how this applies to when you're explaining and counselling patients, but also when you're recommending these routes in future. So we've discussed oral and the, that it's a very common route of administration. It's possibly the most favourable route because of um, the options available. And we talked about it being very simple route. It's portable, it's preferred, it's not invasive. Um, you get good absorption and it's cheap. So it gives a lot of options and within even the formulation of a tablet or a capsule, the all route is um, adaptable. You can make it um, things you'll learn in future about slow release formulation, modified release, enteric coated formulation. So when you're looking at modified release, this can maybe for one medication that needs to be given multiple times a day, it can be released over time. And you will learn more about these formulations and it's a very exciting thing to be able to offer these options as well as enteric coated which protects the stomach or it protects the drug from um, if, if the stomach uh, could break down the medication because of the acidity so the formulations can be modified and there's a lot of complexity in this which you'll learn more about but think about when you give medication orally there is a reduced bioavailability because medication has to go through what we call first pass metabolism, which is the liver breaking down the medication. There's going to be a delay in the onset of action and absorption is going to be affected by content in the, in the stomach, such as food, enzymes in the stomach, which break down the different pH and the transit time. So if someone was having um, diarrhea or anything like that, which would impact the time it, it stays in the GI tract, the, the gastrointestinal tract. So sometimes people have difficulty in swallowing or they have um, issues with being uh, sick, so vomiting, unable to swallow. They might be having an operation where they're nil by mouth or they might be unconscious. So all of these examples where patients can't have oral medications. When we're considering the sublingual route, this is under the tongue. So you can see in this image here that the absorption is under the tongue and it's a very vascular, uh, lots of blood vessels and, and it's, it's got a very good uh, blood circulation. So the absorption is across the mucous membrane under the tongue and this um, bypasses the liver. So it avoids first pass metabolism. So if you give this medication in this fashion, you should get 100% bioavailability. It's quick in absorption. It gives a quick onset of action. So this is very helpful for things like uh, glycerol trinitrate GTN tablets or the GTN spray where someone's got angina and chest pain and they want a quick effect. So you will hear about this again in, in your sessions going forward. But these are very helpful when someone is needing something very quick and you can see the tablet could be removed if need be but if it was a spray obviously that's going to be more difficult to to remove so it's only the tablet that could possibly be removed and things like suboxone or subutex buprenorphine you will see this in substance misuse in some clinics in in community pharmacy i've worked in prisons where this is very helpful um, for people with heroin or it's sort of morphine addiction and this is a substitute. So this would be given and put under the tongue and we would observe the patient, keep it under their tongue for it to dissolve. And obviously this could be removed. So some patients could pocket it and hide it and then uh, sell it on or remove it so it would be something that sometimes a pharmacist needs to observe this it being left under the tongue and then melted and and so it's it's actually uh, been absorbed into the system you will also see things like nicotine which is also sublingual because of the sublingual effects again if someone is stopping smoking you want something that works quickly so that's why this is a really handy thing to have so somebody 
it's it's taking this uh, micro tab under their tongue this would give a quick effect like they've had a cigarette so th other things to consider it's not going to last very long it's got a very short duration of action so you would need to repeat it so things like this would need to be repeated and we talked about the spray might not be able to be removed and sometimes they do taste unpleasant so because of the way they stay in the mouth under the tongue sometimes people will have um, a taste a bad taste that they might not find pleasant most of the times they are masked with different flavors like mint to cover the flavoring then we've got buckle root which is inside the mouth so this is under the cheek so using the um, mucosal area again of the membrane of the cheek but also on the gum so you will see this is um, if you were to open the box of the bucket stem which is something you can see over the counter over the pharmacy shelves this is sold um, as an over-the-counter preparation for nausea and vomiting and with migraine so patients can buy this if they do have migraines and nausea and they're not able to take medication orally it works very quickly it's got quick absorption onset of action it avoids the first pass metabolism so you get 100 percent bioavailability it's very good for things like this where for sickness it can be given for unconscious patients because it doesn't require the swallowing reflexes and there's no risk of choking it can be used for example if someone was having a seizure you can use this for an unconscious patient you can remove the tablet because it's a tablet form it can be removed however compare it to the sublingual it's got a longer duration of action so it lasts a lot longer compared to sublingual the disadvantage of this again similar to the previous sublingual route is the unpleasant tastes for some people but you can see generally there's a lot of advantages for these routes we're going to be looking now at the parental routes so again these are very important and you can see there's a high risk of this um, again just looking at it obviously you're using a sharp object there's risk of needle injuries it needs somebody that knows what they're doing to go through and do the right angle so if someone's giving it intermuscular you need to give it at this right angle right into the muscle and you can see the angle changes depending on where it's so if it's subcutaneous intravenous or intradermal so it's affecting the different layers of the skin So we're going to look at the dermal layer which is something again you might hear of a lot of now with the cosmetic surgery industry a lot of dermal fillers so this is things like um, where people have wrinkles they could have dermal fillers to improve the appearance and, and give them a more smoother skin sometimes you also see this as an implant so patients might have this as a contraceptive um, a preparation so it's a subdermal implant so the intravenous route this is the direct administration into the bloodstream so it's into the vein so when you look at this image you can see it's a 45 angle and it requires somebody with skill and training that knows um, how to administer this type of preparations so you will see that you would get an immediate drug delivery we talked about previously that it's a fast acting you would get 100 percent bioavailability it doesn't um, have first pass metabolism you can give large volumes and it, it is going to be diluted so it is important that it is given in the correct manner because if we think about the disadvantages there is risk of extravasation so if someone administers it incorrectly and misses the vein that could cause damage to the other um, tissue and you can see here also the other intra filtration so these are all technique problems where it's done wrong and it causes damage or problems into the um, other tissue areas 
It can be painful, it can cause discomfort. If it's given incorrectly, they could cause an overdose, risk of infection, so the importance of a technique and aseptic a cleanliness. Um, patients are more dependent on others, such as a nurse, to administer this preparation. It requires skill. So if somebody was attached to a bag of intravenous preparation, that might affect their mobility and ability to move around or, you know, run or do any activities because of their mobility will be affected by having this attached to them. So once it's given, it's irreversible. It's very difficult, especially if, some, if there's an error. So it's high risk in error and it's expensive, not only because of the preparation itself, but also the dependency and the requirement for a nurse. So you got to add the cost of having the skilled uh, practitioner administering this as well, which adds also cost. So then we've got subcutaneous, which is a route that patients do learn and can learn how to use, such as an insulin. This is a preparation where a patient is taught how to use this. And a lot of patients do learn how to administer things like the heparins or the low molecular weight heparins post-surgery. So if they've had um, operations and they need to be on uh, anything to prevent further clots, they could be taught how to use this. But the more common ones you'll see is the insulin, and that's a very common thing that patients use subcutaneously. So it's easier than using IV. So there's a, a bit more of an easier, less involvement here of skill. Slow uniform absorption. Its rate of absorption can be controlled and it's less painful than administering other painful pain um, medications such as intramuscular or intravenous. Again, it still requires some level of carefulness with the technique and the risk of infection. It can have a low uh, or a slow absorption rate, so it's not going to be quick. It's going to take some time. It's less predictable than an intramuscular injection and you need to give less volume. So the volume that's given is going to be a lot smaller than compared to we talked about IV using large volumes. We're using much smaller volumes with subcut. So intramuscular route, again, this is a what we call a parenteral route. So you could see compared to subcutaneous, it's a deeper injection into the muscle. So the, the size of the injection would be larger. So you can imagine if somebody was overweight, then the injection would also need to be larger. So the size of the injection will increase if someone is obese and depending where, where that's injected. So you will notice that some uh, packaging or some medications do recommend if, for example, it's in the gluteal area and the buttocks area, a different size needle is used. And you can see that this can be an easy route to use in compared to IV. However, it's lots of disadvantages of this because it's painful. Again, there's a risk of infection, limited volume because of the, the it could be more painful depending on the volume. You usually recommend two mil to three mil because larger than that it's going to be very painful and causes damage it can cause um it can be slow and erratic absorption so it's um usually problem with children because they have smaller muscle mass or elderly again they might have smaller muscle mass where we would need to be very cautious if imagine if someone was also on a blood thinner so there would be a risk of a hematoma where it would develop into um, or risk of uh, causing a bleed. So just consider these kind of things. There's quite a few disadvantages of giving intramuscular and thinking about, you know, patient preference because of the painfulness of this. So I personally work in mental health and one of the things that we use are intramuscular injections, especially in helping people to have medications 
that for example this is an option to help people have medication in different formulation that they can have it weekly or monthly instead of having to take tablets every day or if they're forgetting to take their medication it increases the risk of relapse so there's a decanoate which is an oil based which lasts longer this one is the weekly or every two weeks or monthly injection compared to acuphase which is the water-based medication and this is because it's water-based it will only last 72 hours so there's a big difference in these formulations so just paying attention to the wording and the packaging you can see here it says acuphase so this is a common error where the packaging has got confused you will learn more about this in your future years but just think about from now recognizing looking at these things when you are in practice so as we were saying earlier intravenous is the fastest route then intramuscular then subcutaneous and you can see there is going to be difference in the pharmacokinetics so it's really important that we are aware of the different routes that are used So as I said, in mental health, it's really important to know the difference between the routes, but also seeing the advantage of having these options. So when someone's very unwell, for example, someone is experiencing distress, or it's helpful to know how long medications take to work. So if I was giving someone haloperidol, if I was giving this as a tablet, I will know that it takes about an hour for it to start to work but the peak effect so the maximum side effects will be two to six hours and it will last for 20 to 20 hours so if i was to give this intramuscular this will work much quicker it will take 20 minutes and the peak so the peak of the effect will take 20 to 40 minutes so you can see this is an advantage about knowing the difference between the routes because now I've got more options to help someone if they are in a lot of distress and maybe one hour is too long to wait. We need to treat them quicker to help manage their distress or help them feel better. So again, this comes across if you look at the other preparations. So things like olanzapine work even quicker as I am. But if you compare here, for example, Lorazepam. Lorazepam works quite quickly as a tablet, the 20 minutes to 30 minutes. This is pretty much the same as the IM. So you can see sometimes there will be little difference between oral and IM. So this is again helpful to see if it's a painful injection, then it might not be necessary to go for an, oral, uh, an IM preparation because we know the oral will give us a very similar outcome. So you could really see that the difference is huge between different medications. So knowing this helps us to give options and, and better advice. So just take that in, into consideration. Just have a think about even though there's differences between oral and IM, there's still differences between the types of medicines available and the way they work in our body. We'll learn more about this in the third year when I teach you about mental health. However, it's just something to be mindful of is we don't use intramuscular injection as a first line route. So you can see here we always go for oral medication first because we talked about it earlier. Oral is always more pleasant. It's much more acceptable. We only use IM if oral is not effective or there's, there's no other option. So it's something just to be mindful of. It's options that are helpful, but we always need to consider the, the, the patient choice and what's more acceptable first. So you can see here, we talked about IM. Um, lorazepam is very similar to oral lorazepam. So we, we try and go for the oral first.
There is also another preparation called loxapine, which is inhaled. You can see this oral inhaled. So these are also new and developed options. So it's very exciting working with all these different options because as pharmacists, we're always kind of looking through and broadening the horizons and the options. So when we look at inhalation, this obviously involves the lungs. Inhalation is a local effect. We're affecting the lungs locally. This will help um, things like asthma. We, you probably heard of different inhalers and seen this. You will learn more about the different preparations, but it's also used in anesthetic. Or you'll see things like nebulizers. The advantage of this is the lung has a very large surface area for absorption and rich blood supply. So it can affect things locally and it can also be used for a systemic action into the rest of the body. The disadvantages could be that you need big equipment or it could cause irritation. Then we've got topical roots. So we've probably seen lots of different preparations of creams, ointments, gels. Again, you'll learn more about the differences between these. But the advantage of these is they act locally and they can be soothing, but they can also be messy and difficult to apply. So thinking about these are really useful options and they are things that you will learn more about how to um, look at this in a lot more of the formulation perspective. So then we've got transdermal, specifically things like patches, which you'll see, which also you'll learn more about, about the importance of the different formulations and that we can't cut these. And these are all really important things around how these are very helpful. They're, they have, um, again, in improved accessibility to medications not being needed to use sometimes daily. Sometimes these patches can be used weekly. This one specifically can be used every three days. They're non-invasive. They, they have a continuous effect, long lasting effect, but they take a while to take effect. They're slow onset and it's a fixed dose. You can't cut these uh, types of patches a patient will need to use the whole patch or change the strength of the patch. Then we've got things like injections into joints, which are for local effect. Again, these aren't common. However, it's just for you to be mindful of the different routes. But these can be also painful, limited volume and can cause damage, especially you need to think about technique and importance of um, somebody that is highly skilled and knows how to do these techniques. Then we've got intraspinal, lots of different procedures which again require high skilled practitioners that know how to administer these because of the risk involved. And intrathecal, again, I think you will learn about this further when you look at um, risk of error because they're such high risk areas. So they can be used for anaesthetic and they could be used to treat infection, malignancies, but they're high risk procedures and sometimes life threatening or even have caused death if used with the wrong medication. Then we've got the rectal route. Again, this is cultural in the UK. There's probably less rectal use. It's probably used mainly for things like um, constipation, it's also used in conditions like with people with colitis, obstructive colitis or specific Crohn's. Because of the, the route we're trying to reach specific areas in the colon. But there are a helpful route. Because of uh, the way that. So when considering the routes of administration, the rectal route is a common route which has advantages such as um, it can be used in vomiting or someone that can't swallow. If someone's had a seizure, we can use diazepam rectally. However, we are moving away from using rectal diazepam and moving towards the buccal midazolam in a lot of places because it, it, it involves 
um, not having to expose the patient. So if a child is very unwell um, and uncooperative, they're not able to swallow medication. It's useful if the medication is irritating to the stomach. It has rapid absorption and a local effect as well. It's less favoured in the UK. We can imagine why that is because it's of the, the way it's inserted into the rectal area can be quite in, invasive for some people. It can be quite unpleasant. It can be erratic, ir irregular. You can see there's good blood supply. However, you've got the the blood supply is also makes it erratic and irregular and unpredictable. So then we've got the vaginal route. Obviously, this is female only. Um, it's things like different formulations are available, or it could be things like contraception, like the IUD, the intrauterine device. So it's a local effect. It's got good um, blood supply in the area, but it's not something that women would have unless it was a local effect. And you can imagine it can be less favorable. Men also can have uh, different things that can be inserted, but it's usually in the transuteral route. This is usually used for erectile dysfunction. And you can imagine this can be an unpopular route as well because of the, the, the discomfort. So it's not a very popular thing to be, um, or something you would see in practice very commonly. So although I've discussed quite a few different routes, I do emphasize the importance for you to remember the common ones. So these are the kind of the common ones you'd expect to know very well. So really think about the advantages and the disadvantages of these and think about the practicalities in practice. So You have got a test on Blackboard, five questions for you to apply your knowledge and test your knowledge. And once you've completed that, um, you've completed this section.